Good morning, folks. This is Steve from Southern Illinois, and as you can see behind me, we've got white stuff this year. Uh, this week, it's a balmy 14 degrees down here in Southern Illinois today. And for those of you in New Zealand or elsewhere with the metric system, that's minus 10. But according to the weatherman, it's the actual effective temperature is 10 degrees lower. So let's make this quick, shall we? Okay. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Vivian bought a bag of sunflower seeds. Uh, winter's been dragging on here and uh, the birds were looking hungry. And so she um, bought some sunflower seeds and we started putting them out just on the railing on the back deck. And it didn't take the birds more than just a couple of minutes to find them the first time she put them out, which was kind of surprising because it's probably been five or more years since we've fed the birds here which hasn't stopped them from checking by every day to see if there were, were any food in the uh, feeders. Um, the feeders eventually came down because of some landscaping and they still stopped by and looked around and then went on. But <clears throat> when we put the seeds out this time, I mean, it was like a frenzy. The, the local gang showed up, uh, that's the Blue Jays, uh, they showed up almost immediately. It was like they'd had a lookout watching our back deck. And it raised the question, how did they even know the seeds were there? But uh, when we did some research, we found out that, you know, birds actually, uh, blue jays, the average life expectancy is 16 years. That's almost, a, that's long as a dog. Um, and so they have long enough time to uh, actually develop memories which kind of puts that stereotype type of bird brains uh, to, uh, to a rest. Well, we only bought one bag of seeds. And so I've been doling out them, them out parsimoniously. And, you know, some days there were seeds there and some days there weren't. And uh, it was interesting to watch the behavior, okay? the birds would show up right now there's a towhee that's that's hopping up here on the the deck here with me um they would show up to check if anything was there and sometimes it was funny you know once i saw a blue jay he did the most human shrug and shake of the head like man why don't you shape up you know you were supposed to have fed me this is just ridiculous <laughs> and uh you know, what happens at bird feeders? Who shows up besides the birds? The squirrels. And the same thing happens on our deck. The squirrels started showing up. And when we didn't feed them, one day Vivian and I were sitting at the kitchen table and and uh, the squirrel came up and got up on the railing and no seeds there, got down on the deck, no seeds there. And so it actually walked up to the sliding plate glass door that separates our deck from the the kitchen where we were eating and he looked inside and he looked from Vivian I mean you could tell that he was looking at us and he had this most reproachful look on his face and then he reached out with one paw and just kind of touched the glass and it was just so cute I mean it was like Aren't you going to feed me? Needs seeds. You needs to feed me. Which brings me to today's question. What makes something cute? As I researched this, I discovered that what we term cute, things that we think of as cute, are things that are infantile, baby-like. Um, a human who looks more like a baby is more likely to be termed cute. Uh, young animals are termed cute. Uh, grizzly old dogs, we don't talk about them as cute. And um, things that are cute when we study our brains, when we show pictures of things that we as humans think of as cute, our brains release dopamine, a pleasure chemical. 
So there's something actually going on inside of our brains when we see cute things that make us feel happiness. And that elicits a protectiveness, but also an aggressive possessiveness. We want to hug them. Or, or have you ever heard somebody say, oh, you're so cute, I could eat you. Child actors like Shirley Temple in her heyday are termed cute, but as they grow older, their bodies change and they lose the cute factor. We would never term Senator Tem Temple cute because she isn't cute anymore. She may be capable, she may be beautiful, she may be intelligent, but she's not cute. We have to develop a, a new formula for success uh, that brings joy through other means than cuteness. Sometimes cute works and some, sometimes it doesn't. Have you ever um, had a kid who tried the cute approach? What happens if it doesn't work? Uh, they pull out the stops. You now, every parent has had a child say to them, I hate you! I wish I wasn't your kid! You see, that's the cute factor gone wrong. That's cute, cruel. They know we love them. They know we are protective of them. And declaring that they don't love us wounds us. And so we set up rules to, uh, to guard against this manipulativeness because, you see, the cute look, okay, my son, grand, grandson, Ethan, he mastered the cute look by the time, before he was two. When he would want something, he didn't just say, Mommy, can I have? No. He puts on these big round eyes and this sad, mournful face and says, Mommy, can I have a cookie? manipulativeness do you see cute and manipulativeness go together and so parents set up these rules like no playing mom and dad off against each other if cute doesn't work on mom don't go to dad okay um, or no means no continuing to ask is just going to get you in trouble okay these are the ways we parents protect ourselves from the manipulativeness of cute. Second question for you, for me. Do I play cute with God? Face it, we all have reproached God. It doesn't matter where on the religious to spiritual and not religious continuum we are. We've all reproached God. We ask why. Why did you let such and such happen? If God is such a loving God, then why all this suffering in this world? Why don't you talk to me? Why don't you just make it clear? Why? And our whys, by and large... They're all reproachful. We blame God for the unhappiness, the suffering, the inconvenience of our lives. And we come to him with these lists of things that we want him to do for us. Ignoring what he's already done. Or we give him the cold shoulder because he hasn't given us what we want. Or we distance ourselves from him because we want to feel powerful. We want to feel capable. And playing cute, helpless, childlike, babylike, just somehow feels demeaning and we're above all that. As one of my friends said once, the hardest thing I have with Christianity is that it tells me I need a savior.
Sometimes being cute is downright cruel. Now, don't take me wrong here. Cute is not evil. Cute is a normal part of being human, of the human experience, of human relationships extending far beyond the baby stage. Cute is not always cruel, but when it is cruel, it cuts to the heart. When I read the sayings of Jesus, I find some things like this. You can't do anything without me, he said. Boy, doesn't that express a condition of powerlessness that as children we all, we all in, uh, experienced? But then, he, then in another place he says, but when the Spirit comes upon you, you'll be able to do greater things than I have. Now, that's the opposite of powerlessness. There's no doubt that prayer is a religious thing, but is it possible for me to pray, to have a form of religion, but to deny the power of it? The Bible tells us, tells me, that Jesus sacrificed and suffered a lot to clean up the mess that we humans made. To make a possibility of us escaping the trap that we have created on this earth. But rather than feeling gratitude or appreciation, how often do I find myself doubting him, angry at him, because I want him to do more, to do something different? in my life. Talk about cruel, cute. And when I'm feeling spiritual but not religious, I face a similar tension. I dislike being religious because in my mind it's associated with being weak, needy, cute. And I don't think of myself in those terms anymore. I'm not a child by any stretch of the imagination, although some people would term me childish. I want to be a grown-up. I want to be thought of as a grown-up physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. That means that I'm mature, capable, and self-sufficient. I'm not dependent or needy. So it's hard for me to act cute with God. But aren't I, in fact, just being cruel to him? As cruel as re I, religious people are when they're whining and complaining, my distancing and refusal to accept him is just another flip side of cruel, cute. Okay, weird thoughts, I know. But that's where my spiritual journey took me this week as I watched the birds and the squirrels on my deck. And I found value in it. So, I'm sharing it with you. Spiritual, but not religious. Religious, but spiritual. All of us have to face the question of whether we are cruel, cute. Be safe, my friends. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. And I am going to retreat into the warmth of my house. Have a good week, and I'll see you next week.